Hi, everybody. Hi, good evening, and thank you for joining us for our community lobby training. I am Maria Del Mar Gonzalez, and I am with the ACLU. I'm the Community Outreach Fellow. I just wanted to welcome you all, and thank you for joining us. And with that, I will let you with our amazing speakers. Thank you. My name is Marina Lowe. I'm the Legislative and Policy Counsel with the ACLU of Utah. Um, you just heard from Maria Del Mar Gonzalez, and I'm also joined tonight by Jason Stevenson. These two are fellow ACLU colleagues and my legislative sidekicks this year, and I'm so grateful for their assistance. I'm going to pass the mic to my fellow presenters now so that you can see them. It's really fun to be able to do this event as a coordinated one, where we partner up with all of our um, friends on the Hill with whom we regularly collaborate. So with that. So I'm Heather Stringfellow, and I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at Planned Parenthood. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Preston Hilburn. My preferred gender pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, I'm the Programs Manager at Equality Utah, and I've been doing this work uh, full time for about four years now. So I'm really excited to be here and share what I've picked up along the way. Hi, I'm Stephanie Pitcher, and I'm the director of the Utah Women's Coalition. I'm Troy Williams, the executive director of Equality Utah. Thanks so much for being here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started here. Yeah, would you? Thank you, Marita. Thank you. So, um, you know, this, uh, let me start first by just letting you know the, the origin of this event. We started doing a community lobby training many years ago now. I think this is probably our sixth or seventh year. Um, and really the idea was to make the legislative process a bit more accessible and, and help you all in the community who want to feel like you have a voice up on Capitol Hill understand the process, how a bill becomes a law, how to interact with your lawmaker, so that you can take advantage of the 45 days when they are up on the Hill passing policy that impacts all of us in our everyday lives. And you can raise your voice and contact your legislator and actually impact the policy changes that are being made every year. So that is the goal of our event tonight. Um, what we're gonna do is talk a little bit, I've put up our agenda here, we're gonna talk about what a community lobbyist is, what that means. We're gonna run through the legislative process so that you understand each piece in the process when a bill is being introduced, debated, heard, and voted on, and how to track the bills and issues that you most care about. Um, we're going to talk about how to participate in the legislative process, and this is really the nitty-gritty of how you interact and communicate with your legislator. And finally, we'll talk about hot topics. Each of our organizations track bills. Sometimes they're the same bills. Sometimes they're different bills. And we want to take a moment to highlight the issues that are most pressing this session in case they're of interest to you and if you want to add them to your own bill trackers at home. And then, you know, it says here audience questions at the end, but I do want to encourage you all, if there are things that you want to ask during the course of our presentation, you're welcome to raise your hand. We have some volunteers tonight who are willing to come out and bring a microphone to you so that we can all hear the question that you're asking as well. Okay, so let's start first with what is a community lobbyist. So really, lobbying is the practice of convincing a legislator of your position. Um, it often involves advocating, so you're taking a position one way or the other. You're educating, and this is often a surprise to people, I think. You, you often have something to share with a lawmaker that they may not know, and so take advantage of this opportunity to share a little bit about the issue that you care about with them. And you participate. You really get involved in the process. You're not a spectator just reading what happens in the newspaper the next day. You can actually be involved in this process and have a real impact. Now, I do want to point out this picture right here. Um, this is actually what's called the lobby up, at, up on Capitol Hill. This is in front of the House of Representatives, but there's a similar area in front of the Senate. And this is where the term lobby really comes from. This is where if you go up on any given day during the legislative session, you'll really see a throng of people outside these doors that, that enter into the either floor or uh, House or Senate chamber. 
Um, and the throng of people that you'll see out there are lobbyists. They're professional lobbyists. They're nonprofit lobbyists. They're folks like you and I who decide that they care about an issue and want to go up. And you may not know this, but when you go up and the Senate or the House are on the floor debating bills, you can actually send in a note to them and they can come out and speak to you in this area called the lobby. So it's a great way to practice advocating, educating, and participating. Okay, Heather, oh, I think this is you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I know. <laughs> so I get to explain um, the crazy days of the legislative session, or the process anyway. Um, so our legislative session um, is once a year, and it's 45 days. This year, it started on January 22nd, and it will end on March 8th. Um, I know <laughs> we're already looking forward to that, um, but it is, uh, it's rocking and rolling already, I have to say. We're one and a half weeks in, and we're busy, busy, busy. Um, in addition to the regular uh, session, they also have interim meetings. So the legislature meets on the third Wednesday of every, or most months, during the year as well. So our house, or our legislator, legislature is made up of two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, so the House of Representatives has 75 members. Um, currently there's, I think, 62 Republicans and 13 Democrats. Um, and Greg Hughes is the Speaker of the House. And on the Senate side, we have 29 members, and I think I have these written down because I can never remember them. 24 Republican and five Democrat. So you can see those numbers aren't super balanced, um, which makes um, our work even more challenging at times. Um, but the Senate president is Wayne Niederhauser. Um, and interestingly enough, both of these um, legislators have said that they're either not running again for their position or, and or not running again for the legislature. So next year is gonna have a whole new um, leadership team in the legislature. So, um, this is kind of har hard to understand out of context, but I'll get back to it. Um, the bills receive up to three readings on each side of the legislature. Um, and to pass a bill, essentially, the magic formula is you need 38 votes in the House, 15 votes in the Senate, and then one vote from the governor. Um, but there are a lot of ways to kill a bill, which is the good part, I suppose. Um, and, you know, the governor, it's something that I didn't realize until I started lobbying for Planned Parenthood, but the governor actually um, has three options when a bill comes to him. So it passes through both houses or both chambers of the legislature and then comes to the governor, and they have a choice of whether to sign the bill, to veto the bill, or do nothing. And if they do nothing, the bill um, becomes law without their signature. So, anyone have any questions about that? It's all pretty simple. Um, so how does an idea become a law? And essentially, it uh, starts with an idea. Wherever that idea might come from, it could come from you. Um, it can come from an organization like Planned Parenthood. Um, it can come from all different um, areas. Um, and that, so that idea is percolated and it's developed um, and then, typically, you have to find a legislator who will run your bill and is interested um, in the bill and the, the, the reason for running the bill. Um, and then they ask their attorneys at the legislature to help draft a bill. So their attorneys actually, or I think they're all attorneys, their staff anyway, um, help draft the bill so that it reads how it's supposed to read and it doesn't conflict with the other laws that are in place. And like I said, there's, so there's the House or the Senate, and a bill has to originate in one of those two places. If it's a um, House of Representative member that, who's running the bill, who's the bill sponsor, it starts in the House. If it's a senator, it starts in the Senate. So um, it comes in, a bill will come in, and it will be read on the House floor, and it's called the first reading. Um, once the first reading happens, it goes into their rules committee, 
and then their rules committee will look at the bill and then assign it to a standing committee. So it moves from rules to a standing committee. Um, and typically, they, the committee makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't, but oftentimes it will be, they'll try to send it to a committee that knows um, about the subject matter of the bill. So it goes to a standing committee um, and it has a hearing. Um, 24 hours before the hearing, it's on the agenda at a hearing. Um, it actually will be posted to the legislative website. So if you're watching, you can see when it's on the agenda and when there'll be a hearing. So if you're interested in a bill, you can come and sit in the room and uh, testify if you want. We'll get into that a little later. So um, in the committee, um, it can pass out favorably with a favorable recommendation. It could not be passed out because there weren't enough votes. Or there's some other things that could happen to it, but basically it could die in the committee. So that's a good place to kill a bill if you're, you're so, <laughs> if you'd like to anyway. Um, and so once it comes out of the hearing at the committee level, it goes back to the floor. So it goes back to the floor for what's called a second reading. Um, and then it goes on to the third reading calendar, which is a calendar where you know you can look again on the website and it will tell you when it's gonna come up for a debate on the floor. So when it gets up and it's, it's turn on the third reading calendar, um, it's, uh, it's read it again and they vote. So the entire body will vote whether to pass the bill out favorably, to not pass it out, um, and then if it passes out, if it doesn't pass out, then it is done. If it does, then it moves to the other chamber. So if it starts in the House, it goes to the Senate, and the reverse if it starts in the Senate. Um, if it passes both chambers, and it has to be the same bill that passes both chambers, um, it goes to the governor. It's enrolled and it goes to the governor, and the governor has a certain timeline, which I can't remember off the top of my head, to take action on a bill. Um, the governor can actually start signing bills fairly quickly, um, but if they, if, they, if they choose not to sign the bill, it will just go into effect in 60 days. See, I can figure this out myself. Look at that. I can. Um, so how do you track a bill or issues? So you, you either it's your bill or you hear about a bill or you're signed up to receive one of our organizational action alerts um, is the best way, I would say, because that's what we do is we track bills. We watch every day to see which bills are coming out and what they're about. Um, and, the, and we oftentimes will boil it down for you so you can understand what exactly the bill is saying. Um, but a, a, an incredible tool, although I think we're all in agreement that the website was changed just right before the legislative session started, and it's not quite as good as it used to be, but we still have a really great website, our legislature, um, that allows you to do quite a few things, track bills. You can ask um, to receive emails when your bill moves, when it gets on an agenda. You can ask for all sorts of things, so it, it um, helps you. Um, to track from home and be a couch citizen lobbyist, as it were. Um, you can also listen and watch online. If you can't come down, I mean, a lot of people work full time, so it's hard to come down during the day. Um, you can take your lunch break or sneak away, and you can um, watch things online um, live or listen to them online live, um, or they're recorded. So you can always go back and listen to the recording as well. So, ah, she's way in the back. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you. Um, two questions, actually. I would assume that there are amendments that are made to bills as they move through the debate and the readings and so forth. So that's one question is, does it start back to zero if, if they, okay. Um, and the second question is, listening and watching proceedings, is the only time that you can actually make a comment during, is during the hearing itself? Is that when you're allowed to actually make a comment? Or, and can the public make a comment, or do you have to have some standing in the issue? Those are very good questions. So um, there's actually a procedure about how bills are amended and whatnot, but essentially they don't go back. They kind of or an overlay. Um, sometimes they'll substitute an entire bill. 
So there'll be a substitute. Um, sometimes it's a small tweak and it's an amendment. But if you're looking on the website, you can see on the, what side is that, right-hand side, that they, um, they'll have them all marked. And you'll, you can ask it to just show you the most current copy, and so it will meld them all. Um, so it never goes back. I don't think it ever goes back to square one. They just keep adding on. And the exciting thing is, is sometimes it's amended in committee, then it goes to the floor and gets amended a couple times, and it goes to the Senate and gets amended. So they have to match. So they have to reconcile if they are, there are amendments made on either side. And the way that people can speak um, is traditionally in a committee hearing. And anyone can speak. Um, usually, there may be a slide on this, and someone else is going to speak to this issue, but quickly. Um, essentially, what happens is the bill sponsor will um, present their bill and have speakers that they have lined up. And then they'll open it up to the audience. They'll open it up to whomever wants to speak to the issue. Depending on the timeline, they may ask you beforehand and ask you if you're going to speak to the, for the bill or against the bill. Um, oftentimes, they'll have a time limit. So you want to come with a nice prepared statement and short, crisp, you know, a minute to two minutes. But yes, you can absolutely um, participate on the committee level. You're giving our runners something to do. It's good. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to know if there's any benefit uh, in terms of starting at in the, a bill in the House or in the Senate, if there's any real difference or advantage to starting a one over the other. Um, I, I mean, it kind of depends. It depends on what type of bill it is. Um, I mean, my experience, and these guys could, might um, feel differently, is that oftentimes it's more challenging, especially for progressive issues, to get through the House. So it kind of depends on who your bill sponsor is um, and what the issue is at hand. But um, either way you slice it, um, you have to get through that chamber. Um, so it's kind of nice to pick up steam and get to the House with a lot of, you know, having the Senate voted out favorably. But either way. Can I ask? Yeah, here she comes. The only thing I would just say that sometimes for the ACLU, at least, the house is an easier place. So I think really um, you're always making that calculation when you're introducing a bill. You're thinking about which body is going to be easier. Do I want to start in the house? Do I want to start in the Senate? The obvious benefit to the Senate is you have far fewer people to lobby. You only have 29 legislators that you need to con convince versus 75. So that's one calculation. But I think Heather's absolutely right. You got to get through both. So, you know, it sort of depends. But I think you're always making that calculation, and sometimes it depends on your sponsor, and it always depends on your issue as well. Um, all right, any other questions for that slide? Oh, we've got one in the back. If I could just follow up on a question that she asked, I don't think I got answered. Can you uh, contribute to the, I think it's the committee, why you're online, or do you have to be physically oh, present? Oh, I didn't hear that part of it. Is that, Good is question. That question. Oh, no, 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 your ahead. other two may answer. Um, and the answer is the way that you would contribute, um, if you're at home during a committee hear hearing, is to send emails or text your legislator while they're sitting at their, it's like a, I don't know what, dais maybe, that's a, a table that they all sit at. Um, they have access to computers and whatnot. Um, but there is no way um, to submit or speak in the hearing without being there and without being present. Some people will send like written statements and ask people to read them, like at Planned Parenthood, we're happy to do that for you as well. Um, so sometimes people do that so that your statement is on the record. Another question in the back. So we can attend committee hearings. Where do we find information about the committee hearings? So um, if you go uh, to that, the website was on the last slide. Let me see if I can figure out how to back up. So there, um, yeah, please. So, yeah. So right here, so this is the, the website right here, le.utah.gov. 
And if you open that up, it will tell you, like at the very bottom it says, there's a calendar and it will have lists of all the committee hearings that are going on that day. Um, if you go on the top bar, you can actually click on a commit the committee um, piece and then you can actually look at the specific committee. So if you're, you know your bill is going to a specific committee, you can click on that and we'll tell you the members, it will give you the agendas for their meetings. We'll have a link, or it used to have a link to the recording from past meetings. Um, so like I said, our website is um, quite good. Um, and so there's quite a bit of information there. And then, then if you go and ask to, for it to be tracked, if you ask for your bill that you're watching or a committee, you can sign up to get notifications when committees are meeting. They'll send you an email and they'll tell you when your bill's up or they'll send you all the agenda and meeting minutes. So it's really great. All right, here we go. Um, so what does it mean to be a community lobbyist? Um, really, I mean, it's the same thing that I do. Um, I'm a paid lobbyist, but I'm a citizen. I ha I'm a constituent um, of both a House member and a Senate member. Um, so it really is the same thing. Um, and, and when I'm um, lobbying for something, the first thing I, need, I do is I get to know my legislators. Um, for you, um, you can jump on the website. You can see it right up there. That's a URL. Um, but our website actually will automatically, um, if you allow it to track where you are, it will, or your, yeah, where you are, then it will tell you who your House member and your Senate member is on the new website. But you can search. You can go in and, and type in your address, and it will tell you who your people are. And then I like to look at their, their they have a, a page on the website. I like to look at that and see what they're about, read about um, what their issues are, what committees they're in, um, what they've done in their professional life, if they have a profession. Um, so I like to get to know them. I, I always introduce myself before there's an issue at hand. So it's always nice, I mean, in, during the interim session, um, it's really a good time where they don't feel stressed out as, as much as the 45-day session. It's a really good time to get to know your legislators. Um, so, you know, I always try to figure out how, how we connected, how we connect, what is that thing that links us? So I think about, you know, I look at their Facebook page, I, looked at, I look at their um, Instagram accounts, their Twitter accounts, and I say, what is it that ties us together? Um, and, and then I set up a meeting and I get to know them. Um, oh yeah, there's a contact for the governor. Get to know the governor, I suppose, or you can just ca copy down his number. So um, if, there, if, it does, uh, if there is a bill that passes through the legislature that we want to veto, um, it works very well to email the governor or call the governor and ask them to veto the bill. Um, like I, I mentioned earlier, if you sign up for one of our, and at the last, the last slide, you'll see how you can sign up for our action alerts. Um, you can sign up for all of them, but um, we will send it to you. We'll, we'll, we filter through things. We'll, we'll um, help you understand exactly what's going on with a particular bill, and we'll tell you when it, it is time to take action. So if we feel like we want people to come to a committee hearing, we'll send out an action alert and ask you to come to a committee hearing with us. If we need people to testify about a specific issue, we'll do that as well. So if you sign up, it helps, it will help you kind of distill all of this information because there are like a thousand plus bills every legislative session and it's overwhelming. So we'll use us to help filter bills and information. Um, like I said, call and meet with your legislator. Um, you can write emails and letters, I suppose, um, but most people send emails these th days. And if you can get a hold of their and have permission to text them, that's another good way um, to communicate with them. Um, we also you have a Facebook page. All of us have Facebook pages um, where we post information. So follow you, the groups that you're interested in. Um, on Instagram, Facebook, all the fancy stuff, Twitter. Um, Twitter is really uh, popular during the legislative session, so that's a good way to see what's up as well. Hi. Um, what type of hashtags would you use to be able to get in contact with your legislators or like 
promote your bill? Young person? <laughs> um, one that I use pretty often is hashtag Utah poll, so U-T-P-O-L. Um, Marina Del Mar might know some more. Utah Ledge is another one. Do you want to come up younger millennial? <laughs> So if, you, so if you just want to get picked up generally in Twitter, you'll do Utah Poll or Utah Ledge, but make sure to also tag your specific legislators um, or somebody like Ben Winslow, <laughs> if you want to get picked up. He is the king of Twitter in Utah politics. So I think that's it for me. I'll come back around when we start to talk about Planned Parenthood's bills. Go ahead. You said, get permission to text a legislator. Could well, you explain? Well, so, you know, my, I like to use kind of the rules that I um, abide by for, like, my friends and the people that I want to establish a relationship with, and I wouldn't text them unless they invite me to do that. So, but I'm kind of old-fashioned. Um, so I always like to feel like it's okay for me to start texting people because you can look them up on, I mean, their phone numbers are listed on the website and whatnot, and I, I can tell when it's a cell phone, but I think, hmm, I'm not going to text them unless they've invited me to do so. What do these guys think? <laughs> I'm not quite as old-fashioned. <laughs> I, I do agree. It feels somewhat different, the use of cell phones, just because I think a lot of people use them for personal purposes as well. But I think when a legislator puts up a cell phone and they're using it for their work purposes as a state lawmaker, um, I think it's okay. What I would do, however, is some sort of introduction. And it's kind of hard to do that in a text. So you may choose to do it by email first and then say, I'll be following up by text. I see that you have your cell phone listed. So that's almost kind of like what Heather was saying. Um, but if you, if you want to, just go ahead and, and just send a text um, saying, hi, I'm Marina, I'm a constituent. The problem with text is that it is so short, and oftentimes if you want to get your legislator's attention, and we'll talk about this a little bit further down, um, you want to establish that you are a constituent. Um, and sometimes you do that in an email by listing your address so that they know for certain that you live in their district. And so that can be hard to fit into a small text. I think texting is really better once you have a relationship established and then you can communicate quickly back and forth. Increasingly, texting is amazing because it's so fast. So if a bill is on the floor, you can get a message to your legislator right as they're considering voting on it. Um, and then the final thing I would say is if you take advantage of the interim session to sort of build a relationship with your legislator, that can be the time to say, can I use your cell phone to communicate with you or to send them an email? And then during the session, it's very easy to exchange text messages because you've already sort of established a relationship. What emojis are the best? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what emojis are the best? That depends on the legislator, of course. They all have their personal preferences. There's a question in the back. Is this slideshow available over the cloud so we can just pull it from there so we have all these references and we can get to the links by pressing buttons? We will be uploading it. We will be uploading it afterwards. Thank so you. Yes. Any other questions? All right. Well, I will be back. I'm going to do some mic switching so we can divide and conquer our runners. Hi. Um, so there are a couple tips and tricks to remember. I think we're a little tangled here. Let's see if we can make it more free. Ha, thank you. Tax support. Perfect. Um, so there are a couple tips and tricks to remember when we're communicating with our elected officials and trying to lobby. The first and probably most important one to remember is to be polite. Um, this one we really like to stress because when you're lobbying and you're being an engaged, active member of the community, um, 
it's important to keep in mind that you're likely going to be communicating with folks that don't necessarily share the same point of view as you, um, right? If we were lobbying folks that already agree with us, we're not really going to get anywhere. And as um, was mentioned earlier, the, the makeup of our legislator is primarily Republican. So more often than not, you're gonna be talking to folks that don't necessarily share the same point of view or agree with you on particular issues. Um, and that's, that's important uh, because we're trying to convince folks to move with us in order to pass legislation. So going in with an open mind and realizing that they may not agree with you at first and being polite um, goes a long way in, in helping to keep those communication channels open and that dialogue flowing. Um, another thing that's really important and is really easy for folks to, I think, forget, and even sometimes I forget this, our elected officials are citizens of Utah, just like you. Um, I remember the first time that I went up to the hill being really scared, um, seeing these people up on this, this golden hill seems kind of you know out of reach. And it's easy to think that they're experts in everything and that they already know um, everything there is to know. But there are over 1,500 pieces of legislation that pass through the hill. And they have to think about these things very quickly and so most of them aren't experts in a lot of things that they're dealing with. So your, um, your feedback and your input is really important to this process. So just keeping in mind that um, you are just as qualified uh, to, to be up there and having these conversations as anybody else. Um, the next thing is to do your research and to know what you're asking about. Um, although these folks aren't experts um, in, in all issues that they're working on, they do um, rely on the folks that are having those conversations with them to, to know what they're talking about and to come up with, um, you know, some, some facts and figures ab about the issues that they're lobbying around. So do your research, go unprepared, um, and that can also help a lot with you feeling more comfortable and, and less nervous if you're already ready. Um, the next thing is to, to find out um, more information about your legislator and the things that they have in common. This um, is another really useful part of the le.utah.gov website, website that you are gonna need to use often when engaging in this kind of work. Um, under each legislator, there is um, a conflict of interest disclosure that tells you where they went to school, uh, what boards they're on, um, where they work, what kinds of stocks and bonds they hold, and really all kinds of important information that can help you figure out some of the things that you have in common, which is really important when you're making that introduction, right, and trying to, to find that common ground um, to know a little bit about them. So using that as a resource. Um, practice what you have to say with your friends and family first. Um, even the, the, the first time that I went up there, um, I remember being so nervous that I was kind of stuttering around and couldn't really get to what I was trying to say. Um, and even still, um, I practice what I'm gonna say with the folks that I work with and the volunteers that we work with, just so I'm comfortable and I know that when I go up there, I can get my point across and, and leave what I wanna leave them with. Um, be confident. Again, this is one of the things that we stress a lot. Your voice matters. Um, you have the tools, talents, and capabilities to address the concerns, uh, address your concerns and expectations with the lawmakers. They're not experts in everything, um, so it's important for them to get feedback. And then once you're doing these things, um, you are no longer a spectator, but you are actually actively engaged in part of the lawmaking process. Um, another really cool thing about being a community lobbyist is that there are a lot of ways for you to get engaged and involved in ways that make sense for you. Um, there aren't a lot of volunteer opportunities that you can do like a million different ways, but this is one of those things that you can do in ways that work for you. Um, so one of those ways is to make a phone call. Um, legislators pay attention to phone calls that are for or against issues. So just because you assume your lawmaker is gonna vote one way or the other doesn't mean you shouldn't make a call and tell them that you agree or disagree with them and why. Um, phone calls are most useful when a vote has been scheduled and there's not time for a letter or a visit. Um, 
letters and visits uh, can be more impactful because it can be easier to, to share more of um, the personal stuff through those formats, but there's not always time for that. Um, so phone calls will usually be answered by an intern um, unless you have the legislator's cell phone number. Not all of the cell phone numbers are up on the legislative website, but a good portion of them are. So when you make a call, um, it's, it's likely that you'll get an intern. Um, and then another important thing to remember, and a lot of folks forget this, is to give your name and your address. The reason that you give your address is so they can verify that you actually live in their district, um, which gives you more clout. Um, another thing that's really easy to kind of forget is to talk about one issue per call. I know we all have a lot of issues that we really care about. There are a lot of uh, bills that pass through both the House and the Senate every year. Um, but just talk about one thing per call and make multiple calls per session if there are other things that you want to talk about. But when you focus, about, uh, uh, focus on one issue at a time, it's easier to get your point across um, in a more clear and concise way. Um, keep your phone calls short and simple. Again, I think that kind of ties in with just one issue per call. They don't have a lot of free time during the session. It's a really short session, and they have a lot to cover. Um, and uh, having like a simple script is another tip that I find is really helpful. Um, and that can look something like this down here. I support bill name and number because um, enlist a couple of reasons. Try to make some of those personal. Uh, share a story about how it impacts you or has impacted someone that you know and care about and not just facts and figures. That can help um, that message stick a little bit more and then ask them to vote for or against the bill. Does anyone have questions on any of this? Okay, moving along. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you heard. What, the question was, what's the deadline for filing? A deadline for filing? So the deadline to, to file, to open a bill file? Yes, how, how soon does that have to be with the legislator in his hands before, or her hands before they can file? Uh, you know, I can't, do you, this, I can't remember this one. It's been a long day. Hi, so there are deadlines, in fact, by which bill files need to be open. I don't have all of those dates memorized, but if you go to le.utah.gov, the website we've talked about a couple of times, there's a um, link that says significant session dates, and it lists all of the different deadlines. Um, but, you know, legislators are still opening bill files and bills are still being released slowly but surely. If you go online, and I should also put in a little plug, the ACLU does a cyber lobby training as well where we walk people through the legislative website because it's such an important tool. Um, we did that earlier this year and it's available online, so you're welcome to consult that training as well. Um, but you can go online and you can see a list of all the bills that have been filed already and there are, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of bills that are out there right now. What you'll notice is that there are two different types of bills. Some of them have a link that you can click on and you can actually see the bill language and others are just a bill file so you can see the title but you can't actually see what's going to go in it. And the reason I mention that is there's also a deadline by which all of those bills need to publish their language. Um, and all of these dates are listed on the website. Um, and happen, you know, within the next few weeks. We have a really short legislative session, just short of seven weeks. Um, so things really have to happen quickly, but we have not yet hit that deadline, and legislators are still opening bill files and are still releasing bills as we speak. In fact, while I was waiting over here on the side, I just got an alert about another bill that had just been released. So um, it's not too late, even now, to be talking to legislators about bills. It's, it's probably not as effective to wait until two weeks in the session to think about opening a bill, but it isn't too late. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, we have one back here. <laughs> yep. My question is, if you end up calling and it is answered by an intern, is it better to leave a message or to ask for information that you can get directly in contact with the representative? Um, 
usually if they have an intern in my experience and there may be some other advice over here, but um, usually legislators that have an intern do so because they act as sort of a gatekeeper. So leaving a message with them um, and then maybe asking if there are additional ways to get in touch with them. Um, that way, if they don't have another option um, or another number for you to call, at least their intern has that message. Um, if you get an intern, you can also send an email. So try using multiple communication channels to get that, um, that message through or whatnot. Does that make sense? Anything else you wanna add? No? Okay. Anything else? All right. So the next method, um, and this tends to be the better method that we have seen uh, folks have more success with this, is to write emails and text messages. Um, with text messages, I do agree that it is best to, to introduce yourself and make some sort of connection first. However, there are a couple of lawmakers in my experience that are a little bit harder to get a hold of than others. And when that is the case, um, I text them. I don't really wait for that. that introduction to be made, but always try first. Um, so legislators count the emails and text messages for or against an issue. So throughout the session, they'll make tallies, uh, a lot of times this is an intern's job, of how many messages or emails come in about a particular issue. So each email you send or text message you send in a lot of ways is a vote and is counted. So they are really impactful and important. Um, with text messages and emails, and this can be a little harder with text messages, um, make sure that you state your name and that you are a constituent and um, the position you're taking and exactly what you want your legislator to do. So in the end, telling them to vote for or against the issue and why, just so it's very clear um, to them what you want and they know that you're gonna hold them accountable. Um, just like phone calls covering one issue or one subject per email, if you have more than one issue, don't be scared to send multiple emails or multiple text messages. Um, you might want to spread those out over a couple of days, but it's okay to contact them multiple times. In fact, that's probably where you're going to have the most success if you do keep contacting them and letting them know that, um, that you're watching them and you're going to hold them accountable. Um, if the issue can be identified by a bill name and number, include it. Um, not all issues have bill names or numbers yet, um, especially if you're talking about something that you want the legislator to do. Uh, for example, if you have an issue that's important to you and you want them to, to start writing legislation for it. But if there is a bill name and a bill number, it's important to use those because they deal with so many things throughout the session. Um, request a reply if you want one. A lot of times if you don't request a reply, um, they won't get back to you just because they hear from so many people throughout the session. Um, but if you request a reply, uh, in my experience, the vast majority of the time they'll get back to you. And that can hold those communication channels open and make it easier for you to, to continue to engage with them, um, not only during the session, but in the interim um, or in between the legislative sessions. Um, continue to write your legislator as your bill moves throughout the legislative process. I think I mentioned this before, but as you see the bill move or get voted on, um, continuing to engage and have these conversations, uh, that way they know you're watching. Um, and then always thank the legislator as if um, they, they voted or acted the way that you would have wanted them to and thank them for their service. Um, that goes in with being polite and keeping those communication channels open. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think we have something. Um, I just wanted to add two things. Um, one, um, use the subject line to indicate, right, what bill you're probably talking about. It catches their attention immediately. And even through their vote yes or no, if you're actually writing to them um, on a, for a hearing. Um, and another thing is these instructions can be applied to tweets. Um, and so I know that Twitter is extremely popular with the vast majority of our legislators. So tweet them and just hashtag the bill number that you're referring to. Somebody had asked earlier like which hashtags to use, right? And I'd said Utah poll, Utah ledge, and I forgot to say the bill number if you know what it is. So H, HB or SB. 
the number. Um, and that way, um, a lot of other people will be tracking that specific bill and they'll see it. And of course, always tag the legislator you're speaking about. Um, so that was what I wanted to add. I suck at the Twitter, so I'm glad we have an in-house Twitter expert. <laughs> um, do folks have questions about this or the Twitter machine? We have a question up here in the back. Um, what's a good way to politely request a reply? Um, you know, I am a little bit more blunt <laughs> in most of my emails than a lot of people probably would be. But I ask, I just, just like straight up ask them to get back to me. Um, at the end of the email, I, you know, sign off, like, I look forward to your reply. Like, I just assume they're going to, and that's how I do it. I don't know. Does anybody have, the, have a better way? Cool. Cool. Just assume they will, and let them know you assume it. <laughs> Anything else? I thought I saw another hand. Maybe not. One more. Do you find this actually works with your Utah legislatures? Um, I have written and written and written and written to my um, congresswoman and both senators about bills on the national level, mm -hmm. and they just seem to completely vote against the will of the American people. Is that what's happening here in Utah as well? Um, in my experience, I find that it's easier to engage with our local elected, local elected officials in the House and Senate here in Utah. Um, the population that they cover is smaller, um, and they, you know, the, the policies that they're, they're enacting or repealing um, affect just Utah, so they tend to be a little bit more concerned with their constituents' input, um, at least in my experience. Do you have something you want to add? And you can chase them down. Yeah, I would absolutely echo that. It's a totally different ballgame, I think, contacting your state-level elected officials than it is, you know, our Congress people for the reasons that Preston mentioned. But also there's an important thing we haven't talked about yet tonight, which is, you know, I sort of refer reference, we have a really short legislative session, just seven weeks long. The benefit to that is twofold in my mind. The first is that there's a limit to how much damage can be done when the clock strikes midnight, they're done after seven weeks. Um, but the other real benefit is that we don't have career politicians here in Utah, at least not our state House members and senators. At the end of those seven weeks, they go back into their communities, they mix with their constituents, they bump into them at the grocery store and at the post office or whatever it is that they do. Um, they're doctors, they're farmers, they're pharmacists, they have everyday professions like all of us. And so there's much more of an opportunity actually to interface with these folks. Um, as Prince, Preston mentioned, they have far fewer constituents than our federal delegation. And so they do sort of pay attention to their constituents far more than our federal delegation does. And we've also touched on the fact that they just have an intern as their staff. You know, probably when you've called um, you know, our senators or our House of Reps, you don't talk to them, right? You talk to a staffer, and they have many staff people that screen calls. That's not the case for your local state senator or state representative. They get an intern during the legislative session that comes from one of Utah's universities. That's it. That's their staff. They have nobody else. Um, that's, you know, it's truly amazing if you think about it that they post their own cell phone numbers to a website and you as a constituent can just pick up the phone and call it, and they may actually answer. Um, not a staffer, but they themselves. So try it if you've never done it before. Find out who your legislator is. Perhaps during the interim session, see if you can meet with them. Go have a cup of lemonade with them or a cup of coffee if they're inclined to drink coffee. Um, Introduce yourself, tell them the things that you're interested in, the policy issues you see in your community, and establish a rapport so that during the session, when you see an issue that really matters to you, you have somebody that you already know that you can contact. Any 
Any other questions? Cool. So I think it may be actually going back to you, but I'm not sure. Yep, I think this one's you. Thank you. All right. Um, so we sort of already touched on committee hearings, but I'll go over this briefly. Um, so in my experience, I have always felt that committee, committee hearings are the place where a bill is most closely vetted. And so it's really a good opportunity for you to come up, share what you think, um, how you think legislators should vote, and really educate them on the specifics of the bill. Um, and as Heather mentioned, the agendas for the committee hearings are posted 24 hours in advance. If you are online and you're tracking an issue, then you can go on to the, uh, to the website, and if you scroll all the way down, it will show you all the bills that you're tracking and when they're set for committee hearing. Of course, you have to check it frequently, given that notice is, is so short with our legislature. Um, and as this says, your, your testimony can often influence the way that a legislator votes on an issue. Um, become, become familiar with the committee process. You can also look online again and see who is on the committee. Um, you can look at the legislators, see how many Republicans and Democrats are there. Um, maybe email them beforehand. Again, in my own experience, I find emailing a legislator usually at night, the night before the committee hearing comes up, is a little more effective just because they're not at the legislature. Um, they're home usually after 8 p.m. is when I will do it, and I tend to get a little bit more responsiveness or at least a confirmation that they have seen my email. Um, or you could send them an email maybe an hour before the committee hearing comes up. One thing that we do uh, with the Women's Coalition is that we'll look and see what type of issue that we're advocating for and what types of people we think should be there and that legislators should hear from. So if it's an issue, for example, like paid parental leave, um, of course we want someone there, a, a woman or a, a parent, who would be impacted by this legislation, but we'd also like medical professionals there to speak to the medical benefits of parental leave. We like other employers there who can speak to um, the fiscal impact or the lack thereof that these types of policies create. Um, and so we look to see kind of more comprehensively who should be at that committee hearing and how can we get them there. So I think for yourselves as citizen lobbyists, so you can certainly do the same thing. You can see, you know, if you think your testimony would be beneficial or if there are others who, the, who you think should be there. Um, sometimes they will ask you questions after you give testimony, so be prepared to answer those. Um, and I think Preston mentioned this earlier, but it's best if you come up to the Hill prepared with what you're going to say, and usually if you just within the two to three minutes that are allocated. All right. Um, one other way that you can chat with your legislators is by going straight to the House or the Senate and sending in a note to them. Um, you'll see that the gre there are green notes for your House uh, for your legislators, House legislators, and blue notes for your Senate legislators. Um, it's also helpful if you are a constituent that you make a note of it on your card. Um, legislators tend to be a little more responsive when they know that their, constituent out that their constituent is outside and waiting for them. All right, other ways to lobby. Um, so letters to the editor are, are really fantastic and I think can be very effective. Um, we found that sometimes we will try and, to the extent that's possible, try to uh, coordinate a letter to the editor with roughly the same time that a bill is going to be heard in a committee hearing. That's obviously hard to predict sometimes when you only get 24 hours notice, but there are other times when you can kind of predict when a bill will be heard, um, and so it's nice if you can kind of get the immediate attention at the same time that your bill is being uh, heard at the legislature. Um, keep it short and on topic. If your if your letter goes too long or your op-ed or whatever, you run the risk of just not getting it published. Take the time to write it out and make sure that it's uh, proofread and well written. Um, we've talked already about blogging and social networking sites. We have a couple legislators who are very active on Twitter, um, and so if you do learn the ropes of Twitter, you can uh, communicate with them that way. And again, it's very quick, uh, and it, it can be effective for some of these legislators. Um, and then, of course, talking with family and friends and, um, you know, sometimes people have connections with other senators or legislators um, and can help spread the word that way. I think that wraps up mine. Does anybody have any questions on any of that? There's one right there. 
About those green and blue notes for the House and the Senate, where can you actually access those? So they're right outside, is it called the lobby well? Is that, so it's, it's right outside the lobby well, um, and there's a table there. There will be a couple gentlemen usually in green suits or gray suits, depending on which side you're going to, um, and they'll just have them there. You can just say, I'd like to send in a note. They'll give you a card, and again, you write your name and I think your phone number. And one more thing. Um, in these actual lobbying sessions where you call them out to the Capitol lobby, is there some sort of method that works better than most? You state that you're a constituent. Um, is there something called a fact sheet? Uh, do you just keep a conversational tone or does anything go? Well, when I've done it, I've just said, my name is Stephanie, I'm your constituent. I'd like to speak with you about, and then I say the bill or the issue, paid parental leave, um, and that tends to be enough. The notes are very small, so you don't have much, to, much room to write, um, but it's usually just an indication that I'm here right now and I'd like to speak with you if you can. Yeah, and I'm sorry, just one clarification, like when they come out, I meant. Oh, like okay. When you talk to them face to face, uh, is there something that works better? Oh, than... yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think just being prepared in general is, is obviously going to be better. I've given them fact sheets before. I think that's fine. Um, they may not have a lot of time when they're speaking with you, so you do want to keep it brief, but you could certainly give them something to look at. Thanks. Anything else? I do have something to say about, so when you meet with them, um, do not give them the fact sheet before you speak to them. You want to garner the person's attention. If you give them that sheet before, they'll immediately start reading it and you'll disconnect. So if you have that sheet, speak and then hand it. So that's like good advice. I would say. Um, and then um, the library is actually holding some workshops on how to write for social media. So you can look that up on their website. Are there other questions? Is oh. testimony required in order to attend committee hearings? No, you do not have to testify actually. Yeah, and, and testimony runs really quickly. It's closer to two to one minute. Um, and it's two minutes if they like you, <laughs> one if they don't. So be very concise. I would recommend that you practice what you're gonna say or have, have some notes with you so that you re you, you're there to reach a point and not to start rambling. All right, thank you. Yes, definitely not a requirement to testify. That would, I think, be um, a disincentive for a lot of people to attend. Um, and actually, on that point, that's just another important thing. Sometimes it's a visual benefit to have people attend a hearing and not speak at all but just to pack the room, to demonstrate to legislators that it's an issue that the public really cares about. So don't feel dissuaded from coming up because you're worried about speaking in public. It's always a good sign to show up and attend um, and just let legislators know that the public is watching. So now we're gonna turn to issues. Um, as you can see, the ACLU has a full plate this legislative session. I'm not gonna go into every single one of these because you all can, of course, read uh, this slide yourselves. Um, but I will say that we are focusing heavily on criminal justice issues, which is not different from the past couple of years. That's an area where the ACLU has been able to make a lot of strides up at the legislature. And so we'll continue that with um, things from abolishing the death penalty to working on improving uh, jail conditions um, for folks in our state uh, jails and also um, strengthening the Fourth Amendment protections that we have. So making sure that law enforcement obtains warrants, for example, before they conduct searches and seizures and, and sort of continuing to make sure that those requirements are in place as our technology changes and advances. Um, we're also working in the area of voting rights. There are a bunch of measures moving through the legislature this year, everything from on the positive side of things, making it easier to register to vote through the use of something called automatic voter registration, um, election day registration, which allows you to both register and cast a ballot on election day, not having to register in advance. Um, on the sort of negative side, we're already seeing a bill that would limit the number of days that early voting is available. Um, in our state, and so we'll be working on both the positive measures and pushing back against the negative measures. 
Um, we're also working on a lot of issues that sort of fall into the women's rights camp or gender equality camp. Um, everything from breastfeeding accommodations, um, public accommodations, to um, trying to find the right balance in terms of giving families some paid leave when they have a family situation, such as the arrival of a child in a family. Um, working to increase our anti-discrimination protections in the workplace so that there are actual legal remedies when you're discriminated against by your employer. Um, and then a few other issues, things like expanding access to end-of-life options. This is kind of a, a controversial topic and always a tough one up at the Utah legislature, but nevertheless something that the ACLU will be keeping our eye on. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards about these specific issues. There are already lots and lots of bill files under pretty much almost all of these categories. All right, hey, um, so at Equality Utah, we were really focused um, on this year, a couple of different things that we're taking on. Um, victim targeting, um, this is the legislation that was formerly known as hate crimes. Uh, we don't have a, actually a functioning hate crimes statute in this state. Uh, we've had um, a hate crimes law on the books um, in various forms for the past two decades, but in the past two decades since we started this, uh, though hate crimes occur, and the FBI recently reported that there is a spike in hate crimes activities here in this state and across the country, um, we've had zero prosecutions because the statute simply doesn't work. Part of that reason is because it's not what we call enumerated. And by enumeration, we mean the listing of the various categories, race, religion, ethnicity, nation of origin, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, all of these things uh, that give prosecutors the tools they, they need to bring justice to those people that are victims, who are targeted because of these characteristics. And so we have been working on this legislation for the past three years. Uh, three years ago, Senator Urquhart picked it up. Now Senator Thatcher has picked up the baton and he's carrying it. Um, and what's critical about this is that we actually have Republican sponsors for our legislation. And if you look at kind of the breakdown here, in the Senate there's 24 Republicans and there's five Democrats. All right, and then in the House we have 62 Republicans and 13 Democrats. Now these are some of the most intrepid, courageous Democrats you will ever meet, right? Um, but you can see if we want to actually advance a specific policy, whether you are fighting for environmental issues, public lands issues, reproductive rights, et cetera, if you really want to get a piece of legislation through, you're going to have to convince a lot of Republicans. And they may or may not you know, share your political ideology. So then how are you going to do that? How are you going to persuade someone to come your way? Now, you can get all you know, worked up on, on social media. You can call your lawmaker out, right? But possibly that's going to create more barriers and more actual resistance to listening to you. So we really try to um, really respectfully move in firmly sometimes we have issues, but trying to find ways to actually persuade people who don't think like us. And Heather's alluded to this and Preston alluded to this, but you've got to find that common ground. You've got to find that, that connection. And also I would say probably, and I'm going to, so this is about 85% Republican supermajority, but I'm going to guesstimate that probably the entire legislature, including Democrats, I, I bet probably the makeup is about 90% Mormon. So it's really important that you respectfully, thoughtfully engage Latter-day Saints. And sometimes we do that in, and we do that in lots of ways, but sometimes just the language that we use, using language that they respond to. So we talk about freedom a lot. And I talk about agency a lot. And talk about stewardship a lot. 
Because these are, are words that, that Mormons and Republicans resonate with, that they get. And so you can start to make these connections with them in a way that they can hear you, in a way that they can actually begin to think, wow, maybe, maybe I can move toward them. And the, the optimistic news about all of this is that we have made progress on these issues. And I'm always stunned by, by Heather and Marina. Um, the ACLU and Planned Parenthood and Equality Utah making headway in the, this super Republican Mormon majority legislature, we do it all the time. Utah was the first state ever to pass pro-LGBT legislation in workplace and housing, the first state in the country to pass it through a Republican-controlled legislature. And we did that by actively, smartly engaging Republicans and Mormons and finding common ground. That's really, really the key to being a successful lawmaker here in Utah, is being able to find common ground with people who you think you don't have anything in common with. That's what makes you effective. So victim targeting, um, we've got a lot of people that are supporting this. This is an uphill battle for us. Um, and we, we're at our third year. And, we're, and we have not yet persuaded all of the conservatives uh, to come along with us, but we are chipping away at it. And we're going to keep chipping away at it until we're actually able to pass this legislation. Um, we're concerned a little bit right now, and it's really a new bill that just dropped today called Rep Reproductive Education Amendments. Um, this is a kind of complicated piece of legislation because there's some things that we actually like about the bill, but there's some elements about the bill that we're concerned about. So I put it up here for, this is just a great example. We're concerned that, um, that inadvertently the lawmaker might be um, ignoring and not acknowledging LGBT students in the classroom. So Maureen and I are going to be going and meeting with the sponsor of the bill tomorrow afternoon. And we're going to use our persuasive powers to find ways that we can amend this to make sure that there's equal protections and equal access and all those things for all students in the classroom. So this is like this work in progress. And so kind of keep your eyes on it, kind of see where it goes and how we amend it. Um, but ultimately, I want you to feel empowered. Last year when we had this um, meeting, it was like a couple days after the inauguration and everyone was like shell-shocked and like, oh my God, what the hell is happening to our country? Um, and now you're all here, and I feel that kind of steely resolve, right? You're grizzled, and you're chiseled, and you're ready to sort of take on, you know? And so I am super confident um, that if we engage on the local level, if we engage our city council members and our, our local lawmakers, we're going to make a positive impact in our communities here, and that will make a difference, no matter what the kind of crazy hijinks and, and, and insanity that's happening out of the White House. We know that our community is looking out for us and that we're, we're bound together and that we're working together. And that's how I know we're all going to be okay with all of this. We're going to make it to the midterms. We're going to make it to the next election. And good will triumph over evil. I guarantee it. All right. Any questions about that? Oh, one more other thing. One other cool thing just that I'm really excited about. Um, just two weeks ago, uh, the governor, Gary Herbert, invited Equality Utah and several others to be involved with a, a suicide, youth suicide task force. So we're working with the Lieutenant Governor, we're working with the LDS Church, we're working with Gail Miller and several of uh, the Utah Department of Health, and we're trying to shape policies so that we can send a message to all young people uh, in Utah, LGBT, straight, whatever, that, that they're loved and that they're valued and that they have a place here in Utah to call home. And so this task force, we will be looking for public policy recommendations to give to our lawmakers. Um, and it's really great, this really unique moment. This isn't happening in other states where a conservative governor um, invites the LGBT rights lobby in around the table to sort of look for policy solutions to help LGBT kids. This isn't happening in other conservative states, but it's happening in Utah. So I know you might get discouraged sometimes at how conservative it is, 
um, or sometimes your lawmakers want to pull out, you want to pull out your hair with them, um, or you're frustrated because of their stance on public lands, etc. But Utah is a unique place, and we do, can make progress in this super red, super majority Republican Mormon legislature. So don't give up hope. Feel empowered. I love you. Thanks. Amen. So I guess I have to advance my own slide. So our slide is kind of small this year, which I can't complain about, I have to say. Yeah. And one of them is actually a bill. What? I know. Um, so I would have to concur with um, what Troy just said. It's magical when you can have um, a Republican who's your bill because there have been the last couple of years there have been uh, different legislators who've um, had a bill that would expand um, Medicaid to include family planning services in the state of Utah. So in Utah, um, when the Affordable Care Act went into place, um, <clears throat> our state decided not to expand Medicaid. So there's this group of people, it's called the coverage gap um, in the state of Utah that don't have access to health care. Um, and so, uh, there's a very easy way um, that this state can access Medicaid funds to help expand our ac access to family planning services, which includes contraceptives and information for folks, um, very easily through a waiver program. Um, and so, we have, this has been um, brought up a couple of years by different, different legislators. They've been Democrats, but this year, um, a Republican representative um, Ward is actually taking on this bill and he's doing a tremendous job. Um, he has worked very hard this last year to get support behind it and he's a family physician as well. So he knows what access to healthcare means for his patients and the ability to access contraceptives in particular. So it is blazing along. Um, it came out of the house yesterday um, with a very strong uh, vote. Um, so we are watching that bill. We're kind of um, sitting in the back seat because um, it's just strategically wise to do that. Um, we don't want to be too excited about people getting access to contraceptives, but um, we are. Uh, <laughs> and you should be too. I mean, it helps us all um, when families have access to the health care that they need. Um, and then we have a not so great bill. Uh, it's the Down Syndrome Non-Discrimination Abortion Act. Um, which is essentially an abortion ban. And it's not surprising, really, because for the last, I've been doing this for six years, and every year it seems like we have an abortion ban or something um, to tinker with access to safe and legal abortion in Utah. So this is no different. Um, Representative Lizenby um, has a bill that's actually um, in line to have a House floor vote, probably tomorrow or the next day. Um, but it's an abortion ban, and it's an unconstitutional abortion ban. Um, you know, uh, if you had asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said, gosh, do we really want to litigate? Would we want to get into a lawsuit? And, and today I say, hell yeah, we do. Um, and so, you know, bring it on. If you want to pass an unconstitutional abortion ban, um, okay. <laughs> but it's unconstitutional, and it won't stick. It won't stand. And we will team up with the ACLU, as um, Planned Parenthood has done in other states, where bills like this have been passed, and they've been struck down. And last but not least, another, oh my god, I didn't even notice this. We have two good bills. Say it ain't so. Um, Representative Ward, again, it has a health education amendments bill that he has just released. It's in um, the Rules Committee on the House side right now. Um, and essentially, it would make it so that when teachers are, right now our sex, sexuality health education curriculum is restricted in what um, teachers can talk about with their students, and this bill would take contraceptive, the restriction on contraceptive conversations out. So teachers could talk to their kids about, their students, about contraceptives. Um, so it's a, an excellent bill, and it's kind of a companion. I mean, if you think about it, it's not, you, I mean, it, there's a continuum. Access to contraceptives, access to information when you're young, um, and healthy decision making. When you're young, it builds on, builds on um, in your teen years and in your adult years as well. 
So it's so far, I mean, it's, we jumped off the ledge, it felt like, last Monday when the legislative session starts, started, but so far so good, um, I would say. But I think that's all I've got to say. I don't know who's next. Oh, you have a question? Oh, okay. My question is, is, why are they specifically targeting Down syndrome? Because there are numerous birth defects and things like that. Why are they specifically saying Down syndrome? You know, um, I guess the easiest way to answer that question is, is that um, it, um, it, it tugs on your emotions. Um, and they have, they have realized that if it's too broad, um, that it is, becomes harder um, in terms of litigation. Um, so they have tried to narrow it down and make it very specific. Um, but really, this bill has nothing to do with Down syndrome, and it has nothing to do with a specific disability. It has everything to do in a, with an abortion ban. Um, and this is part of a national agenda. And if you actually look at the right to life literature, this is actually a piece of legislation, a model piece of legislation. The words were taken right out of it. And it was in fact recommended that the Utah legislature should take up such a, this kind of ban this year. There's a question in the back. Does that, does that, is that what um, you're thinking? Well, I, I was gonna ask one more question. Sure. So I know how bills go through, and I know how, how when you see them on the, on the website, how they have black lines through them. So as this bill goes through and it says Down syndrome, can they continue to add on different birth defects as it goes through or does it have to go through as originally written? No, they could, add, they could amend it and they could add things and they could take things away for sure. So when you look at a bill, things that have a cross through it means that they're taking it out and something that's underlined is something that's added. Um, so it could progress and change. Um, in fact, the amended it or amending it um, to add one word. So there's changes and tweaks as they realize what, it's, it almost is a, a game of chess at times. Um, so they realize what our argument is and what, what we intend to do, and so they try to change it up um, to slow us down, but nothing's slowing us down on this one. Did I get it? Everything? Okay. Question in the back. Um, so for bills, like the one that Troy Williams mentioned, um, there, there's some elements of it that you support and that you don't. Is it better to support the bill to get the things passed that you do want and then like have the opportunity to go back later and kind of fight some things the next year or um, just to not support the bill? Well, I would say that it, it's bill dependent. Like sometimes, I mean, when I look at a bill, I'll think, you know, the bulk of the bill is good. Um, in fact, Marina and I were at a hearing today where I think there are aspects of this particular bill that I found unsavory, but there were things that really didn't matter or didn't do much. Um, so we decided not to do, take action with the bill. Um, so it's all relative. I, say, I would say if, if the, the bad thing isn't a deal breaker um, and the good outweighs the bad, sometimes it's a a better strategy, but I can tell you that it's hard to get things out once they've been passed, in my opinion. Anyone else? Yeah, everyone agrees with me. There's a question in the middle. Um, so you guys said that a bill had to pass through the House and Senate for it to get passed and then to the governor, but if he fails to do anything about it, like what is the reasoning behind that? Just because he doesn't want his name like attached to it? Yes, that's exactly it. Um, I don't know how often um, our particular governor chooses to do that, um, but yes, if it's something that they realize it's a hot potato or they don't want their name, like you say, attached to it, uh, they'll choose to just um, be silent on it and not um, sign it, and it will go into law. Um, yeah, it's a strategy, I suppose. Oh, here comes Marina. She has something to add. Hold on. Well, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes the governor could take the position, like, I can't put my name on this particular piece of legislation, but I'm not going to go against the will of the elected officials, and so I'll just let it go into effect. I think that would be the articulated reason. But I think Heather's right. It doesn't happen very often. Any other questions for me? All right. Stephanie.
Okay. Um, so some of these bills have already been covered, but I'll just maybe go over a couple that are our priority pieces of legislation this session. One, uh, Marina mentioned briefly, but this is a bill addressing workplace anti-discrimination protections. Um, and to understand the bill, you have to understand a little bit about how our anti-discrimination statute in Utah currently operates. So currently, under Utah law, if you work for an employer that employs less than 15 employees, then you have no legal remedy whatsoever if you're faced with any type of workplace discrimination. So for example, if you become pregnant and all of a sudden your employer fires you because they don't want to deal with their perceived, um, your perceived child care problems or anything like that, there's really nothing you can do. Uh, so what this bill would do is it would lower that 15 employee threshold and take it down to one. So everybody is covered when it comes to workplace discrimination. It also includes um, or creates some legal remedies for those employees. Um, employees who work for an employer who employs more 15 or more are subject to remedies under the federal statute, and so this would just close that gap. Um, and Representative Edwards will be sponsoring that one. The bill actually just came out a couple days ago. Um, and then another one that's also being sponsored by Representative Edwards creates incentives for paid parental leave in the private sector, um, creates a tax incentive for employers that provide that benefit to their employees. And so we're tracking that closely and are very supportive of that. Um, Representative Waite will be introducing a bill that provides paid parental leave to state employees. Um, we're hopeful that we, sh we may see some progress on that issue this year. Um, Salt Lake City passed a policy last year. Salt Lake County and the LDS Church have followed suit and a number of other private employers. And so we're hopeful that the momentum is uh, the, the momentum will be felt at the legislature and that this will be the year to, to pass something like that for our state employees. Um, we are tracking also an issue relating to breastfeeding in places of public accommodation. A place of public accommodation is more accurately thought of as a business or any place that offers goods or services for a fee. Um, and currently, we're actually one of only two states in the nation that doesn't protect breastfeeding in those places. So you could be asked to leave or cover up, um, or someone could refuse to provide service to you, and you're not explicitly included in Utah law. So this would, would cover that. Um, and then the last bill I'll mention is a bill that would improve the function of UALD. UALD is the agency that hears employment discrimination complaints here in the state of Utah. Um, our, our state agency finds for cause in only 0.7% of all the cases that it hears, which is really quite, quite um, striking, especially when you see data from other states. Our federal counterpart, for example, finds for cause in, uh, f they're five times more likely to find uh, for cause in these types of employment discrimination complaints. And then our neighboring states are eight times more likely. Um, and so there was, a, there was an audit done recently on UALD and it uncovered a lot of issues with the way that UALD is operating. And this bill would essentially work to try and address that and, and close it and improve the efficiency of the agency. Um, so those are the few that I'll mention, but we do have a legislative tracker on our website. You can follow along on all of the bills that we're, we're covering at utahwomenscoalition.org. Um, and we're also on Facebook as well and active there. Any questions? Okay. Maria the Mud. Are you going to wrap it up? Or Marina? Um, so, if you want to stay in touch with us, right, um, just sign up for our email alerts um, or our Twitter feed. Um, and we also, all three of us, have bill trackers up. Um, so you can see the exact bills that we're talking about. The ACLU is tracking how many bills? I lost count at 60, so that's why Marina didn't mention any bills. She just mentioned issues. Um, but yeah, so we all have our um, bills up. This is um, the information on um, how to be in contact with us. And if you want, become a member and support the work we're doing. And then are there any questions at the end? Is there anything that we didn't cover? No? Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you to all of our partners. And have a good night.